Greetings and welcome back to room 303 in our chats with Emily as we are calling our readings through the poetry of Emily Dickinson and contained in the Johnson edition. We are now at poem 119, Talk with Prudence to a Beggar. Now, this is an interesting little poem. Emily is going to be Emily as educator, Emily as teacher, Emily as lover, as compassionator, and we're going to find some interesting observations here about how to treat those who might be perceived as lesser, disenfranchised. Uh, now, our assumptions that you've been following our stuff at LearnStrong.net, down that left-hand side, Chats with Emily, our playlist, I'm hopeful that you've already been exposed to our introductory set of comments as well as the preceding 118 poems. We just finished with, uh, at poem 118, My Friend Attacks My Friend. It is interesting, the ordering of some of these poems. So, for example, in the last poem, it was a poem about conflict and fighting and getting involved in that fighting. And in this poem, we are going to see Emily at her finest in terms of show respect, show love, show compassion to those who clearly need it. Now, um, we're going to hear this word Potosi. It is the um, Bol Bolivian silver mines and the mountains outside of Potosi where these mines occur. Now, uh, the, in, in Emily's mind, the idea of, uh, of this reference would have to do with the disenfranchised, those who are working so hard in those mines. Now, there is an interesting, I think, story that's standing behind this poem, and it has a lot to do with the famous Matthew 25 parable of Christ. You'll probably remember that he's making an observation about what final judgment day will be like. Now, Emily would know this story through the King James Version, and so I'll share it with you from Matthew 25. 40 through 45, we pick up halfway through the story where we will here have uh, um, the, the king, as in Christ, and the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, inasmuch as ye have done it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you have done it unto me. Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels, for I was hungry, and you gave me no meat. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was stranger, and you took me not in. Naked, and you clothed me not. Sick and in prison, and you visited me not. Then shall they also answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we the hungry, or a thirst, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister unto thee? Then shall he answer them, saying, Verily I say unto you, inasmuch as you did it not to one of the least of these, you did it not to me. Now, I think there's a whole lot of that story standing behind this poem. By the way, notice all the caps in this poem, uh, the capital letters. Um, that You're going to find that one a fascinating one as well. Let's just enjoy the poem. Talk with prudence to a beggar of Potosi and the mines, reverentially to the hungry of your viands and your wines. Cautious, hint to any captive you've passed in franchised feet. Anecdotes of air in dungeons have sometimes proved deadly sweet. Now, of course, we'll not, we'll not pass on the irony of pointing out that our series is called Chats with Emily and the first word of the poem is talk. But notice her wording here. Prudence, reverentially, cautious. In other words, when you speak with others, Show some prudence. So, show some caution. Try to take into consideration where they've been. Now, her use of the word beggar will take us back to poem 49. Do you remember this one? I never lost as much but twice, and that was in the sod. Twice have I stood a beggar before the door of God. She will use the word beggar 21 times. Um, in poem 117, you'll remember that she was talking about requesting alms. Here we're playing a similar game. Talk with prudence to a beggar of the Potosi and the mines. Uh, uh, of Potosi and the mines. Uh, that is to say, when you're speaking with those who are disenfranchised, right? She'll use the word enfranchised, but disenfranchised. Be careful. Be careful with the words that you use. Then she uses what for me is the key word of this poem, reverentially. We're going to see this when we hit poem 169, 
um, uh, and, and I'll, just, I'll just play that game out with you. Um, she says it this way, in, El, in, in Ibn Box, when years have flown, to reverentially peer, wiping away the velvet dust summers have sprinkled there. It's her only other use of this, of this word. Notice, reverentially to the hungry, be careful, right? When you speak with them, speak reverentially to the hungry of your viands, that is to say your food, and your wines. Notice it is your, right? Not our, your. And notice it is wines. In other words, those who are hungry, those who are starving, they don't need to hear about your fine meals. They don't need to hear about the wine that you drink. And then notice the stanza break. And then from prudence to reverentially to cautious, be careful, hint to any captive. And again, notice these capital letter words, beggar, hungry, captive, later dungeons. Cautious hint to any captive, you have passed enfranchised feet. In other words, any, anyone who's in prison doesn't need to be told. There's all these free people out there walking around. And then she'll say it, anecdotes of air. Maybe my Emily Green pointed out this is possibly the reference to some kind of false hope. Anecdotes of air in dungeons have sometimes proved deadly sweet. Now, I find this interesting that our notion of deadly sweet can be, and our Emily group pointed this out to me, that is to say, alluring but fatal. In other words, you've got to be very careful what you say to people who are stuck in a dungeon. If you tell them about all the people who are out there breathing the free air, it might lead them to some kind of terrible action, possibly even the taking of one's own life. Deadly sweet might be that kind of information. Well, what is she really saying in a poem like this? I think she's saying you got to be mindful of those who are less fortunate than you. Now, the Oxford scholar that we've been following, David Priest, has pointed out that this poem might have some particular application to the poet's Emily's own life. Ruth Miller refers to a letter, letter 205, to Samuel Boyles of April 1859, in which Emily says, quote, Friends are gems infrequent. Potosi is a care, sir, end quote. It may be, priest now continuing, that in the poem, Emily is actually warning Samuel Boyles not to offer the Potosi minds of friendship to herself, even though she is a beggar with a desperate need of friendship, unless the offer is made with prudence, reverentially, and with caution. I find that a fascinating read, a way to read this poem as well. At 2B, I love the word choice, prudent, Prudence, reverentially cautious. And then all these capital letters, beggar, hungry, captive, dungeons. It begs us, it begs the question, why? Why is she why is she capitalizing those words? She'll play that game occasionally. At 3A, well, I've mentioned, of course, Matthew 25, 40 through 45. We we read that one. How about this one? Plato has often been assigned this observation, be kind for everyone you meet is fighting his own battle. Um, actually, some research will show Plato himself never wrote that line that we know of. However, it was written by the Scottish writer Ian McLaren in the 1890s who said something similar. At 3B, well, w before I go there, just uh, when we get to poem 9 919, this is how she'll say it. And to me, this is one of the best representations of this idea of Emily's notion of being kind. She says it this way. If I can stop one heart from breaking, I shall not live in vain. If I can ease one life, the aching, or cool one pain, or help one fainting robin unto his nest again, I shall not live in vain. Of course, you can see how these two poems will then go together. At 3B, how do you own a poem like this? What was a time when you were not maybe as reverent as you could have been? Um, you'll remember in our study of Wordsworth's Ten Turn Abbey, what does he say makes a great life? Little, nameless, unremembered acts of kindness and love. I think Emily is challenging us to maybe live a life where we're a little bit more prudent, a little bit more cautious, a little bit more caring, compassionate, can we say? as the Gita says, to recognize oneself in all being, in all being in oneself. Thank you.